is a truth universally acknowledged that every dog is the best dog. Hi, Bailey. And over the course of history, there have been millions of good, good dogs living fascinating lives. Have you ever wondered what life was like for a royal pet in the court of Versailles or what a typical day held for a shepherd's loyal companion in ancient Greece? Me too. I wonder about that all the time. It's a totally normal and regular thing for people to wonder about. <laughs> Welcome to A Dog in the Life. I'm Katie Asaurus, your guide to the dog-eared pages of history. I got like four more of those, so buckle in. In this new series that I'm starting just because I want to, each episode will dive into a different era of history and explore the world through the eyes of our four-legged friends. Join me as we embark <laughs> on a journey to discover the untold stories of dogs who witness history unfold. This is A Dog in the Life, where every tale has a tale to tell. Summer, 1837, the city of London. In 1837, London was already a bustling metropolis of over two million people. It was the capital of the British Empire and a center of world trade and finance and culture and pretty much everything that the British Empire had their hands in. The city was undergoing rapid change and expansion with new buildings and infrastructure and new people arriving daily. Imagine you're a young sailor arriving into the port of London on the Thames River, where docks and ports and canals stretch for 11 miles through the city on the riverbanks. Suddenly, you're swept overboard into the muddy, disgusting, polluted waters of the River Thames. Before you even have time to think, you feel something grab hold of your hand and you're pulled safely to shore where you find yourself eye to eye with your rescuer, Bob. Meet Bob, a Landseer Newfoundland and one of the bestest and bravest boys to ever have lived. Bob is credited with surviving not one but two shipwrecks and saving the lives of over 20 people over the course of his life. He also holds the unique distinction of being the only canine recipient of the Humane Society's Medal of Bravery, something that I'll get to later. So the first question is, why this painting? Why a painting of Bob? And to answer that question, first we need to set the stage with a little historical As the Industrial Revolution and advancements in technology continued to march ever forward, the Victorian era saw this resurgence in an idealized depiction of nature, right? Untouched by mechanical advancements and mass production. There weren't any factories in these paintings. Scenes of forests and flowers and trees and hunting and parks and pretty ladies on swings. This was kind of that idealized depiction of nature that the Victorians were trying to either cling to or bring back, depending on how you look at it. Now, on the other hand, many artists hated the idea of painting another romanticized landscape, and they wanted to use their respective mediums to draw attention to the social issues of the day. And these works, to this day, are still some of the most powerful glimpses we have into the harsh realities of what it was like living in the poverty and equity in Victorian London at the time. And also, I know that there's a lot more to it, but I have like 30 seconds to sum up an entire period of art history, so like, don't add me in the comments. Somewhere between that sort of idealized naturalism and this bringing awareness to social issues was an artist named Edwin Landseer. Landseer is a fascinating artist who over the course of his career painted dozens and dozens of paintings of dogs, but what was particularly unique about them and what I think is really cool about them is that there wasn't much high concept symbolism to these paintings, right? He just let the dogs and their physicality and the movement in those paintings tell an emotional story. Like, look at these dogs! Landseer also painted what I think is the saddest painting of all time. Lancer's paintings are particularly interesting because while they depict dogs who are obviously connected to that idealized version of, you know, Victorians frolicking in the woods and hunting with the boys, he also depicts dogs in realistic everyday situations, what life might actually have been like for these dogs at the time. And a lot of times these paintings often subtly highlight how poverty and social inequity can affect our canine companions. What was poverty like for a dog? And how did that poverty affect the family the dog was living with? It's really smart, right? It's a really smart way to contextualize because we see it even today. We see those, you know, Sarah McLaughlin, in the arms of the angel, 
right? And while in a certain sense that's about the animals, it's also highlighting the fact that poverty impacts animals. Social inequity harms animals. And that's the same exact thing that Lance here was. So what would a day in Bob's life have been like? As a canine resident of the Port of London, Bob would have been greeted by hundreds, if not thousands, of workers and ships and horses and cargo shipments moving daily through the port. I cannot stress enough how busy the Port of London was in 1837. Millions of tons of cargo moved through the Port of London every year, and each dock had hundreds of workers and craftsmen and day laborers, bargemen and sailors, who were responsible for loading and unloading the cargo and making sure that it got to where it was supposed to go. While I like to think that Bob was well-loved and well-respected, the truth is, is that life for dock workers was really hard. It was physically demanding work with very little pay. Injuries, disease, and death were very common. Many of the men who worked on the docks and on the banks of the Thames were unpaid. They were incarcerated prisoners who were kept in decommissioned ships called hulks that served as essentially floating prisons with conditions so consistently awful and so violent that prison reformers in England worked for years to draw attention to these issues. But then on the other side of the coin, as it always is, the men who owned and controlled the dockyards and the fleets of ships that moved in and out of the port were some of the richest and most politically connected figures in England at the time. By 1837, the British Empire's colonizing saw them trading in rare and valuable goods like gold and gems, African ivory, spices from India, Jamaican rum, silks and porcelains and other fine home goods. People wanted fancy stuff if they were rich. And as London continued to grow into this sort of major metropolis, so too did the demand for more expensive luxury goods, which in turn made the ports of London more popular and busier. It's almost like colonizing is bad. So during the day, Bob is seeing ships and people and horses and cargo come and go. But it's also important to note that Bob's view of the Thames was very different than ours today. Like the rest of London, the banks of the River Thames were constantly undergoing construction and changing to adapt to the needs of the ever-growing city. London was built and rebuilt and built again, and it was all witnessed by the sort of ever-present Thames that was just there for public use. They built bridges and docks and canals and plumbing, and they were constantly adding to improve transportation and access to this like very public waterway. In some cases, entire neighborhoods were destroyed in order to make room for these massive docks, and tens of thousands of people were displaced in, in a lot of the cases. There's even one story of a 12th century church being knocked down in order to build one of these massive dock structures that like went out of business 10 years later. And I think that's very... So what did Bob eat? Fun fact, commercial dog food wouldn't be invented for another 30 years in England. And since Bob was technically a stray, he probably would have most frequently dined on the leavings of dock workers. Although once again, I like to think that if everybody thought Bob was a hero so much that he's getting paintings made of him, that, you know, probably somebody took care of him, right? That's, that's just what we're going to go with. But what did the dock workers eat? At the time, pasties and meat pies were exceptionally popular meals and also probably pretty yummy for a dog. And so too were jellied eels. Eels, another fun fact, were one of the only types of fish that could survive in the polluted rivers of the Thames. And so for poor dock workers, that became like a really popular meal for them. Bob probably also dined on his fair share of horse meat. So it's important to remember that at the time, horses were considered more like livestock, how we think of cows today. And there were over 200,000 of them living in London at the time. And so with the huge number of horses needed for transport and daily commerce, disposing of the ones who died became an entire industry in and of itself. And there was a lot of recycling. The dogs that lived and worked on the ships coming in and out of the Port of London also received their fair share of the ship's rations, which was usually some form of hardtack, this sort of bready, cracker-like substance that stored really well for long voyages. And 
fun fact, those ship's dogs tended to be so sort of like healthy and well-adjusted that hardtack, that sort of biscuit, that became the originator of what dog food would become. It's all circular. So where did Bob sleep? Since Bob was, again, technically a stray, it's more than likely that Bob took up residence in one of the local docks. Now, it's important to understand that when I say docks, I'm not talking about the kind where you'd park your summer camp canoe. These were gigantic places. These were massive multi-building structures that functioned not only as parking and offloading for dozens of these huge ships that would come in and out every day, but it was also storage and warehousing for goods being offered. There was housing for the dock workers and stables for horses. It's likely that Bob probably hopped around from place to place and slept where he wanted, but once again, I like to think that somewhere in history there was a kind dock worker who had a nice soft bed for Bob. Remember those incarcerated men that I talked about earlier? A lot of them were responsible for this back-breaking work of digging canals and transporting sand and rock and gravel to shape the banks of the Thames and further this growth. The other thing to keep in mind, the Thames was, and I, I cannot stress this enough, it was absolutely fucking disgusting. By the mid 1800s, the river had been used as a dumping ground for human excrement for centuries. And it was a polluted, disgusting mess. Falling in wasn't just a matter of getting inconveniently wet and ruining your outfit. It was a matter of navigating waste and garbage and animal carcasses and flood detritus and industrial pollution. So being rescued even by a dog as brave as Bob wasn't a guarantee that you'd make it out just fine, particularly since at the time, ingesting the water meant risking diphtheria or cholera or scrofula, which I think So I'm not gonna lie, I kind of chose this painting randomly. This was a series that I've been wanting to do for a while and I just decided like, you know what? It's never gonna be the right perfect time. So I'm just gonna go for it. Um, And just something about Bob and his pose and demeanor, like it just stuck out to me. Um, And it turns out that I accidentally chose one of the most famous dog paintings of all time to start with. So that's cool for me. But because of that, I got to really delve into why this painting still remains sort of part of the collective consciousness. And honestly, that in itself is a fascinating journey into what dogs mean to us. I've said it before, I've said it again. We know that every dog is a good dog, but Newfoundlands have a particular history of being very, very good dogs, particularly in handling heroics under pressure. There are dozens and dozens of historical anecdotes and stories and even documented newspaper articles about Newfoundland dogs saving people from drowning. And for many of that breed at the time, that became their actual job. They were tasked with saving people from the river. And these weren't just like occasional happenstances either. Bob was reported to have saved 20 people himself. And there are many historical accounts that tell stories of Newfoundland dogs braving storms to rescue sailors, save their family's children from being washed away in the ocean. And they would even swim ropes out to stranded boats so they could pull them to shore and they would save dozens of lives at a time in the process. In fact, in 1828, a Newfoundland dog named Harriman saved over 160 Irish immigrants from a shipwreck by doing that very same thing. He swam out a rope and they pulled the boat to safety. There's also a really heartwarming story that I found while I was doing research for this video where there was this Newfoundland dog uh, living and working on a ship and there was a storm and the dog got washed overboard. And the captain was like, nope, sorry, everybody, we have to keep going. And the crew mutinied. They refused to go on. They turned the ship around and they saved the the dog and they went back to shore and i just i that i would turn a ship around in a storm for bailey i don't i don't even care i would just i'd mutiny i would mutiny i get it i get it new finlands as a breed also became very popular at this time even charles dickens the most celebrated novelist of the time he had a new finland dog named bumble I ran the numbers, and just in case you were wondering, while Landseer was creating this painting of Bob, Charles Dickens was working on Oliver Twist. This painting was wildly popular as a piece of art. People loved it, but it also became really popular in another realm, fiber arts. 
In fact, just like the internet of today, there was niche community drama surrounding this painting. Essentially what happened was at the time, German embroidery patterns were really, really popular. And then somebody bought the rights to all of these different English paintings and were like, hey, you can embroider these now. And a lot of people were really offended and really upset. Like you were trying to change our embroidery tradition. And it was, they were like, no, we just thought you might want to embroider this. We're sorry. Community drama. And that I thought was kind of the end of the story and end of my day in the life until my research took a very interesting turn. It turns out that Bob is an This is where it gets really weird. So the Bob in the painting isn't actually Bob. The Bob in the painting is actually another dog named Paul Pry. Apparently on the day that Landseer went down to the docks to try and find Bob to paint him, he couldn't find him. He just straight up could not find Bob and was like, well, that's fine. I'll just use another dog as a stand in instead. So it's here that the historical record uh, diverges a lot. Paul Pry was either owned by a friend, uh, like a neighbor or acquaintance of Landseer or uh, Landseer's cousin, whose name was Newman Smith. And fun historical side fact, Newman Smith was actually the person who owned this painting and donated it to the Tate Museum in 1887. Once again, the historical record varying widely for no real particular reason, but Landseer either first noticed the dog walking down the street carrying a basket of flowers flowers or carrying a love letter for a lady or he met him at a private dinner party when he jumped up on the table. There are differing accounts. <laughs> and frankly, I don't think any of it matters, but God damn it, I had to read it. So you have to know it too. Another thing is that after exhaustively reading through the entire record of the Humane Society, it also turns out that Bob was never actually awarded a medal. That's just sort of like an urban legend. And it also means that the Wikipedia page is wrong, but I don't know what to do about that. So. A lover of dogs continued for the rest of his life. Among his dozens of paintings of dogs, he honored the legacy of the brave Newfoundlands of England somewhere around 1860, painting another one in this painting called He is Saved, which alongside his famous painting of Bob became wildly popular as home decor. His work as a painter and supporter of dogs earned him the reputation as the Shakespeare of dog paintings. Landseer's love of dogs went beyond just painting them. He was a huge supporter of protections for animals and the preservation of heritage breeds. And he went on to become the vice president of the newly founded RSPCA in 1869. Landseer as an artist is a really fascinating person for a couple of different reasons. First, his paintings got a lot of criticism. It was said that his paintings were marred by how sentimental the depictions of these dogs were. But on the other hand, Landseer's works became incredibly popular as home decor because both of his brothers were expert engravers and they made copies of his paintings. They became really popular in lower income households because they could afford the prints. People like pictures of cute dogs. Landseer also didn't just paint dogs. In fact, he was the person who made the lions that you can still see to this day at Trafalgar Square. Thanks to the work of Landseer, this type of Newfoundland dog with the white and black coat became so popular and so iconic that they were ultimately dubbed a Landseer Newfoundland and it is a breed that's still recognized by the Kennel Club today. The real Bob lived to the ripe old age of 14 and thanks to the work of Landseer was celebrated as a hero through not only London, but the world. The best part? Bob's legacy lives on even today. Check this out. And that's it. A little bit about Bob, a little bit about London, a little bit about Landseer, and hopefully you learned a little bit of something along the way. Thank you so much for watching. And before I go, I know some of you might be wondering what the fuck this has to do with my usual content. And the truth is it doesn't. I spent a lot of time this year thinking about what is important to me, what brings me joy, what makes me excited to wake up and make content in the morning. And I frankly have 
really been struggling. And so this year I decided that while I'm still absolutely gonna make ADHD content, educational content, that kind of stuff, I also wanna try and make videos that are simply things that I care about and I'm excited about talking about. And I miss being a historian. I miss being able to do research and deep dives. I miss being able to learn about cool little niche moments in history. And I also just really like dogs. And so I came up with this idea and I'm really excited to, to know what you think, uh, hear your thoughts. So let me know in the comments. Um, if you have a historical dog that you are a fan of and you want me to talk about, please let me know. But if you liked this and you would like to see more, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, my plans were to be holding my dog for this part, but she's sleeping and I don't want to wake her up. So maybe next time. Um, but as always, thank you all so much for being here. Thanks for watching. Uh, and I will see you again soon. Bye.